The Hobbit, or There and Back Again, by J.R.R. Tolkien. Performed by Nathan Wyland. Chapter 1. An Unexpected Party In a hole in the ground, there lived a hobbit. Not a nasty, dirty, wet hole filled with the ends of worms and an oozy smell, nor yet a dry, bare, sandy hole with nothing in it to sit down on or to eat. It was a hobbit hole, and that means comfort. It had a perfectly round door, like a porthole, painted green, with a shiny yellow brass knob in the exact middle. The door opened onto a tube-shaped hall, like a tunnel. A very comfortable tunnel, without smoke, with paneled walls and floors tiled and carpeted, provided with polished chairs and lots and lots of pegs for hats and coats. The Hobbit was fond of visitors. The tunnel wound on and on, going fairly but not quite straight into the side of the hill. The hill, as all the people for many miles round called it, and many little round doors opened out of it, first on one side and then on another. No going upstairs for the hobbit. Bedrooms, bathrooms, cellars, pantries, lots of these, wardrobes, he had whole rooms devoted to clothes, kitchens, dining rooms, all were on the same floor, and indeed on the same passage. The best rooms were all on the left-hand side, going in, for those were the only ones to have windows, deep-set, round windows looking over his garden, and meadows beyond, sloping down to the river. This hobbit was a very well-to-do hobbit, and his name was Baggins. The Bagginses had lived in the neighborhood of the hill for time out of mind, and people considered them very respectable, not only because most of them were rich, but also because they never had any adventures or did anything unexpected. You could tell what a Baggins would say on any question without the bother of asking him. This is a story of how a Baggins had an adventure and found himself doing and saying things altogether unexpected. He may have lost the neighbor's respect, but he gained... Well, you will see whether he gained anything in the end. The mother of our particular hobbit what is a hobbit? Hmm, I suppose hobbits need some description nowadays, since they have become rare and shy of the big people as they call us. They are, or were, a little people, about half our height, and smaller than the bearded dwarves. Hobbits have no beards. There is little or no magic about them, except the ordinary, everyday sort, which helps them to disappear quietly and quickly when large, stupid folk like you and me come blundering along, making a noise like elephants which they can hear a mile off. They're inclined to be fat in the stomach. They dress in bright colors, chiefly green and yellow, wear no shoes because their feet grow natural leathery soles, and thick, warm brown hair like the stuff on their heads, which is curly, have long, clever brown fingers, good-natured faces, and laugh deep, fruity laughs, especially after dinner, which they have twice a day when they can get it. Now you know enough to go on with. As I was saying, the mother of this hobbit, of Bilbo Baggins, that is, was the famous Belladonna Took, one of the three remarkable daughters of the old Took, head of the hobbits who lived across the water, the small river that ran at the foot of the hill. It was often said, in other families, that long ago one of the Took ancestors must have taken a fairy wife. That was, of course, absurd, but certainly there was still something not entirely hobbit-like about them. And, once in a while, members of the Took clan would go and have adventures. They discreetly disappeared, and the family hushed it up. But the fact remained that the Tooks were not as respectable as the Bagginses though they were undoubtedly richer. Not that Belladonna Took ever had any adventures after she became Mrs. Bungo Baggins. Bungo, that was Bilbo's father, built the most luxurious hobbit hole for her, 
and partly with her money, that was to be found either under the hill or over the hill or across the water. And there they remained to the end of their days. Still, it is probable that Bilbo, her only son, although he looked and behaved exactly like a second edition of his solid and comfortable father, got something a bit queer in his makeup from the Took side, something that only waited for a chance to come out. The chance never arrived, until Bilbo Baggins was grown up, being about fifty years old or so, and living in the beautiful hobbit hole built by his father, which I have just described for you, until he had, in fact, apparently settled down immovably. By some curious chance one morning, long ago in the quiet of the world, when there was less noise and more green, and the hobbits were still numerous and prosperous, and Bilbo Baggins was standing at his door after breakfast, smoking an enormous long wooden pipe that reached nearly down to his woolly toes, neatly brushed, Gandalf came by. Gandalf! If you had heard only a quarter of what I have heard about him, and I have only heard very little of all there is to hear, you would be prepared for any sort of remarkable tale. Tales and adventures sprouted up all over the place wherever he went, in the most extraordinary fashion. He had not been down that way under the hill for ages and ages, not since his friend the old Took died, in fact and the hobbits had almost forgotten what he looked like. He had been away over the hill and across the water on businesses of his own since they were all small hobbit boys and hobbit girls. All that the unsuspecting Bilbo saw that morning was an old man with a staff. He had a tall pointed blue hat, a long gray cloak, a silver scarf over which his long white beard hung down below his waist, and immense black boots. Good morning, said Bilbo, and he meant it. The sun was shining and the grass was very green. But Gandalf looked at him from under long bushy eyebrows that stuck out further than the brim of his shady hat. What do you mean, he said. Do you wish me a good morning, or mean that it is a good morning whether I want it or not? Or that you feel good this morning, or that it is a morning to be good on? All of them at once, said Bilbo and a very fine morning for a pipe of tobacco out of doors into the bargain. If you have a pipe about you, sit down and have a fill of mine. There's no hurry. We have all the day before us. Then Bilbo sat down on a seat by his door, crossed his legs, and blew out a beautiful gray ring of smoke that sailed up into the air without breaking and floated away over the hill. Very pretty, said Gandalf, but I have no time to blow smoke rings this morning. I am looking for someone to share in an adventure that I am arranging, and it's very difficult to find anyone. I should think so, in these parts. We are plain quiet folk and have no use for adventures. Nasty, disturbing, uncomfortable things make you late for dinner. I can't think what anybody sees in them, said our Mr. Baggins, and stuck one thumb behind his braces and blew out another, even bigger smoke ring. Then he took out his morning letters and began to read, pretending to take no more notice of the old man. He had decided that he was not quite his sort and wanted him to go away. But the old man did not move. He stood leaning on his stick and gazing at the hobbit without saying anything, till Bilbo got quite uncomfortable and even a little cross. Good morning, he said at last. We don't want any adventures here. Thank you. You might try over the hill or across the water. By this he meant that the conversation was at an end. What a lot of things you do use good morning for, said Gandalf. Now you mean you want to get rid of me and that it won't be good till I move off. Not at all, not at all, my dear sir. Let me see, I don't think I know your name. Yes, yes, my dear sir, and I do know your name, Mr. Bilbo Baggins. And you do know my name, though you don't remember that I belong to it. I am Gandalf, and Gandalf means me. To think that I should have lived to be good morninged by Belladonna Took's son as if I were selling buttons at the door. Gandalf, 
Gandalf! Good gracious me! Not the wandering wizard that gave old Took a pair of magic diamond studs that fastened themselves and never came undone till ordered? Not the fellow who used to tell such wonderful tales at parties about dragons and goblins and giants and the rescue of princesses and the unexpected luck of widows' sons? Not the man that used to make such particularly excellent fireworks. I remember those. Old Took used to have them on Midsummer's Eve. Splendid. They used to go up like great lilies and snapdragons and labanums of fire and hang in the twilight all evening. You will notice already that Mr. Baggins was not quite so prosy as he liked to believe. Also that he was very fond of flowers. Dear me, he went on, not the Gandalf who was responsible for so many quiet lads and lasses going off into the blue for mad adventures. Anything from climbing trees to visiting elves, or sailing in ships, sailing to other shores. Bless me. Life used to be quite into, I mean, uh, you used to upset things badly in these parts once upon a time. I beg your pardon, but I had no idea you were still in business. Where else should I be? said the wizard. All the same, I'm pleased to find you remember something about me. You seem to remember my fireworks kindly, at any rate, and that is not without hope. Indeed, for your old grandfather Took's sake, and for the sake of poor Belladonna, I will give you what you asked for. I beg your pardon, I haven't asked for anything. Yes, you have. Twice now. My pardon. I give it you. In fact, I will go so far as to send you on this adventure. Very amusing for me. Very good for you. And profitable, too, very likely, if you ever get over it. Sorry, I don't want any adventures, thank you. Not today. Good morning. But please, come to tea, any time you like. Uh, why not tomorrow? Come tomorrow. Uh, goodbye. With that, the hobbit turned and scuttled inside his round green door and shut it as quickly as he dared, not to seem rude. Wizards, after all, are wizards. What on earth did I ask him to tea for? He said to himself as he went to the pantry. He had only just had breakfast, but he thought a cake or two and a drink of something would do him good after his fright. Gandalf, in the meantime, was still standing outside the door, and laughing long but quietly. After a while, he stepped up and, with the spike on his staff, scratched a queer sign on the hobbit's beautiful green front door. Then he strode away, just about the time when Bilbo was finishing his second cake and beginning to think that he had escaped adventures very well. The next day, he had almost forgotten about Gandalf. He did not remember things very well unless he put them down on his engagement tablet, like this. Gandalf, T. Wednesday. Yesterday, he had been too flustered to do anything of the kind. Just before tea time, there came a tremendous ring on the front doorbell, and then he remembered. He rushed and put on the kettle, and put out another cup and saucer, and an extra cake or two, and ran to the door. I'm so sorry to keep you waiting, he was going to say when he saw that it was not Gandalf at all. It was a dwarf with a blue beard tucked into a golden belt, and very bright eyes under his dark green hood. As soon as the door was opened, he pushed inside, just as if he had been expected. He hung his hooded cloak on the nearest peg, and, Dwalin, at your service, he said with a low bow. Bilbo Baggins, at yours, said the hobbit, too surprised to ask any questions for the moment. When the silence that followed had become uncomfortable, he added, I'm just about to take tea. Uh, pray come and have some with me. A little stiff, perhaps, but he meant it kindly. And what would you do if an uninvited dwarf came and hung his things up in your hall without a word of explanation? They had not been at table long. In fact, they had hardly reached the third cake when there came another, even louder ring at the bell. Excuse me, said the hobbit, and off he went to the door. So you have got here at last. That was what he was going to say to Gandalf this time. But it was not Gandalf. Instead, there was a very old-looking dwarf on the step with a white beard and a scarlet hood. And he, too, hopped inside as soon as the door was open, just as if he had been invited. I see they've begun to arrive already, he said when he caught sight of Dwalin's green hood hanging up. He hung his red one next to it and, Balin, at your service, he said with his hand on his breast. Thank you, said Bilbo with a gasp. 
It was not the correct thing to say, but they have begun to arrive had flustered him badly. He liked visitors, but he liked to know them before they arrived, and he preferred to ask them himself. He had a horrible thought that the cakes might run short, and then he, as the host, he knew his duty and stuck to it however painful, he might have to go without. Come along in and have some tea, he managed to say after taking a deep breath. A little beer would suit me better, if it is all the same to you, my good sir, said Balin with the white beard. But I don't mind some cake. Seed cake, if you have any. Lots, Bilbo found himself answering to his own surprise. And he found himself scuttling off, too, to the cellar to fill a pint beer mug, and then to a pantry to fetch two beautiful round seed cakes, which he had baked that afternoon for his after-supper morsel. When he got back, Balin and Dwalin were talking at the table like old friends. As a matter of fact, they were brothers. Bilbo plumped down the beer and the cake in front of them, when loud came a ring at the bell again, and then another ring. Gandalf for certain this time, he thought as he puffed along the passage. But it was not. It was two more dwarves, both with blue hoods, silver belts, and yellow beards, and each of them carried a bag of tools and a spade. In they hopped as soon as the door began to open, Bilbo was hardly surprised at all. "'What can I do for you, my dwarves?' he said. "'Keely, at your service,' said the one. "'And Feely,' added the other. And they both swept off their blue hoods and bowed. "'At yours and your families,' replied Bilbo, remembering his manners this time. "'Dwalin and Balin here already, I see,' said Keely. "'Let us join the throng.' "'Throng?' thought Mr. Baggins. "'I don't like the sound of that.' I really must sit down for a minute and collect my wits and have a drink. He had only just had a sip in the corner while the four dwarves sat round the table and talked about mines and gold and troubles with the goblins and the depredations of dragons and lots of other things which he did not understand and did not want to, for they sounded much too adventurous, when ding-dong-a-ling-dang his bell rang again as if some naughty little hobbit boy was trying to pull the handle off. "'Someone at the door,' he said, blinking. "'Some four, I should say, by the sound,' said Feely. "'Besides, we saw them coming along behind us in the distance.' The poor little hobbit sat down in the hall and put his head in his hands, and wondered what had happened, and what was going to happen, and whether they would all stay to supper. Then the bell rang again, louder than ever, and he had to run to the door. It was not four, after all. It was five. Another dwarf had come along while he was wandering in the hall. He had hardly turned the knob before they were all inside, bowing and saying, At your service, one after another. Dory, Nori, Ori, Owen, and Glowin were their names. And very soon, two purple hoods, a gray hood, a brown hood, and a white hood were hanging on the pegs, and off they marched with their broad hands stuck in their gold and silver belts to join the others. Already it had almost become a throng. Some called for ale, and some for porter, and one for coffee, and all of them for cakes, so the hobbit was kept very busy for a while. A big jug of coffee had just been set in the hearth, the seed cakes were gone, and the dwarves were starting on a round of buttered scones, when there came a loud knock, not a ring, but a hard rat-tat on the hobbit's beautiful green door. Somebody was banging with a stick. Bilbo rushed along the passage, very angry, and altogether bewildered and bewothered. This was the most awkward Wednesday he ever remembered. He pulled open the door with a jerk, and they all fell in, one on top of the other. More dwarves, four more. And there was Gandalf behind, leaning on his staff and laughing. He had made quite a dent on the beautiful door. He had also, by the way, knocked out the secret mark that he had put there the morning before. Carefully, carefully, he said. It is not like you, Bilbo, to keep friends waiting on the mat and then open the door like a pop gun. Let me introduce Biffer, Boffer, Bomber, and especially Thorin. At your service, said Biffer, Boffer, and Bomber, standing in a row. Then they hung up two yellow hoods and a pale green one and also a sky-blue one with a long silver tassel. This last belonged to Thorin, an enormously important dwarf, in fact, no other than the great Thorin Oakenshield himself, 
who was not at all pleased at falling flat on Bilbo's mat with Biffer, Boffer, and Bomber on top of him. For one thing, Bomber was immensely fat and heavy. Thorin, indeed, was very haughty, and said nothing about service, but poor Mr. Baggins said he was sorry so many times that at last he grunted, Pray don't mention it, and stopped frowning. Now we're all here, said Gandalf, looking at the row of thirteen hoods, the best detachable party hoods, and his own hat hanging on the pegs. Quite a merry gathering. I hope there is something left for the latecomers to eat and drink. What's that? Tea? No, thank you. A, a little red wine, I think, for me. And for me, said Thorin. And raspberry jam and apple tart, said Biffer. And mince pies and cheese, said Boffer. And pork pie and salad, said Bomber. And more cakes and ale and coffee, if you don't mind, called the other dwarves through the door. Put on a few eggs, there's a good fellow, Gandalf called after him as the hobbits stumped off to the pantries. And just bring out the cold chicken and pickles. Seems to know as much about the inside of my larders as I do myself, thought Mr. Baggins, who was feeling positively flummoxed, and was beginning to wonder whether a most wretched adventure had not come right into his house. By the time he had got all the bottles and dishes and knives and forks and glasses and plates and spoons and things piled up on big trays, he was getting very hot and red in the face and annoyed. "'Confesticate and be bothered, these dwarves,' he said aloud. "'Why don't they come and lend a hand?' Lo and behold, there stood Balin and Dwalin at the door of the kitchen, and Feely and Keely behind them, and before he could say knife, they had whisked the trays and a couple of small tables into the parlor and set out everything afresh. Gandalf sat at the head of the party with the thirteen dwarves all round, and Bilbo sat on a stool at the fireside, nibbling at a biscuit. His appetite was quite taken away, and trying to look as if this was all perfectly ordinary and not in the least an adventure. The dwarves ate and ate, and talked and talked, and time got on. At last they pushed their chairs back, and Bilbo made a move to collect the plates and glasses. "'I suppose you will all stay to supper,' he said in his politest, unpressing tones. Of course, said Thorin, and after. We shan't get through the business till late, and we must have some music first. Now, to clear up. Thereupon the twelve dwarves, not Thorin, he was too important, and stayed talking to Gandalf, jumped to their feet and made tall piles of all the things. Off they went, not waiting for trays, balancing columns of plates, each with a bottle on the top with one hand, while the hobbit ran after them, almost squeaking with fright, "'Please be careful!' and "'Please don't trouble, I, I can manage!' But the dwarves only started to sing. "'Chip the glasses and crack the plates, blunt the knives and bend the forks. That's what Bilbo Baggins hates. Smash the bottles and burn the corks. Cut the cloth and tread on the fat. Pour the milk on the pantry floor. Leave the bones on the bedroom mat.' Splash the wine on every door. Dump the crocks in a boiling bowl. Pound them up with a thumping pole. And when you've finished, if any are whole, send them down the hall to roll. That's what Bilbo Baggins hates so carefully, carefully with the plates. And of course, they did none of these dreadful things. And everything was cleaned and put away safe as quick as lightning. While the hobbit was turning round and round in the middle of the kitchen, trying to see what they were doing. Then they went back, and found Thorin with his feet on the fender, smoking a pipe. He was blowing the most enormous smoke rings, and wherever he told one to go, it went. Up the chimney, or behind the clock on the mantelpiece, or under the table, or round and round the ceiling. But wherever it went, it was not quick enough to escape Gandalf. Pop! He sent a smaller smoke ring from his short clay pipe straight through each one of Thorin's. Then Gandalf's smoke ring would go green and come back to hover over the wizard's head. He had a cloud of them about him already, and in the dim light it made him look strange and sorcerous. Bilbo stood still and watched. He loved smoke rings, and then he blushed to think how proud he had been yesterday morning of the smoke rings he had sent up the wind over the hill. Now for some music, said Thorin. Bring out the instruments. 
Keely and Feely rushed for their bags and brought back little fiddles. Dory, Nori, and Ori brought out flutes from somewhere inside their coats. Bomber produced a drum from the hall. Biffer and Boffer went out too and came back with clarinets that they had left among the walking sticks. Dwalin and Balin said, Excuse me, I left mine in the porch. Just bring mine in with you, said Thorin. They came back with vials as big as themselves and with Thorin's harp wrapped in a green cloth. It was a beautiful golden harp, and when Thorin struck it, the music began all at once, so sudden and sweet that Bilbo forgot everything else, and was swept away into dark lands under strange moons, far over the water and very far from his hobbit hole under the hill. The dark came into the room from the little window that opened in the side of the hill. The firelight flickered. It was April, and still they played on, while the shadow of Gandalf's beard wagged against the wall. The dark filled all the room, and the fire died down, and the shadows were lost, and still they played on. And suddenly, first one and then another began to sing as they played, deep-throated singing of the dwarves in the deep places of their ancient homes. And this is like a fragment of their song, if it can be like their song without their music. Far over the misty mountains cold, to dungeons deep and caverns old, we must away ere break of day to seek the pale enchanted gold. The dwarves of yore made mighty spells, while hammers fell like ringing bells, in places deep where dark things sleep, in hollow halls beneath the fells. For ancient king and elvish lord, there many a gleaming golden hoard they shaped and wrought, and light they caught, to hide in gems on hilt of sword. On silver necklaces they strung, the flowering stars, on crowns they hung, the dragon fire, in twisted wire, they meshed the light of moon and sun. Far over the misty mountains cold, to dungeons deep and caverns old, we must away ere break of day, to claim our long-forgotten gold. Goblets they carved there for themselves, and harps of gold, where no man delves, there lay they long, and many a song was sung unheard by men or elves. The pines were roaring on the height, the winds were moaning in the night, the fire was red, it flaming spread, the trees, like torches, blazed with light. The bells were ringing in the dale, and men looked up with faces pale. The dragon's ire, more fierce than fire, laid low their towers and houses frail. The mountains smoked beneath the moon. The dwarves, they heard the tramp of doom. They fled their hall to dying fall beneath his feet, beneath the moon. Far over the misty mountains grim, to dungeons deep and caverns dim, we must away ere break of day to win our harps and gold from him. As they sang, the hobbit felt the love of beautiful things made by hands and by cunning and by magic moving through him. A fierce and a jealous love, the desire of the hearts of dwarves. Then something Tukish woke up inside him, and he wished to go and see the great mountains, and hear the pine trees and the waterfalls, and explore the caves and wear a sword instead of a walking stick. He looked out of the window. The stars were out in a dark sky above the trees. He thought of the jewels of the dwarves shining in dark caverns. Suddenly in the wood beyond the water, a flame leapt up, 
probably somebody lighting a wood fire, and he thought of plundering dragons settling on his quiet hill and kindling it all to flames. He shuddered, and very quickly he was plain Mr. Baggins of Bag End, under Hill, again. He got up, trembling. He had less than half a mind to fetch the lamp, and more than half a mind to pretend to, and go and hide behind the beer barrels in the cellar, and not come out again until all the dwarves had gone away. Suddenly, he found that the music and the singing had stopped, and they were all looking at him with eyes shining in the dark. Where are you going? said Thorin, in a tone that seemed to show that he guessed both halves of the hobbit's mind. What about a little light? said Bilbo apologetically. We like the dark, said all the dwarves. Dark for dark business. There are many hours before dawn. Of course, said Bilbo, and sat down in a hurry. He missed the stool and sat in the fender, knocking over the poker and shovel with a crash. Hush, said Gandalf. Let Thorin speak. And this is how Thorin began. Gandalf, dwarves, and Mr. Baggins, we are met together in the house of our friend and fellow conspirator, this most excellent and audacious hobbit. May the hair on his toes never fall out. All praise to his wine and ale. He paused for a breath and for a polite remark from the hobbit, but the compliments were quite lost on poor Bilbo Baggins, who was wagging his mouth in protest at being called audacious and, worst of all, fellow conspirator. Though no noise came out, he was so flummoxed. So Thorin went on. We are met to discuss our plans, our ways, means, policy, and devices. We shall soon, before the break of day, start on our long journey, a journey from which some of us, or perhaps all of us, except our friend and counsellor, the ingenious wizard Gandalf, may never return. It is a solemn moment. Our object is, I take it, well known to us all. To the estimable Mr. Baggins, and perhaps to one or two of the younger dwarves, I think I should be right in naming Keeley and Feely, for instance, the exact situation at the moment may require a little brief explanation. This was Thorin's style. He was an important dwarf. If he had been allowed, he would probably have gone on like this until he was out of breath, without telling anyone there anything that was not known already. But he was rudely interrupted. Poor Bilbo couldn't bear it any longer. At May Never Return, he began to feel a shriek coming up inside, and very soon it burst out like the whistle of an engine coming out of a tunnel. All the dwarves sprang up, knocking over the table. Gandalf struck a blue light on the end of his magic staff, and in its firework glare, the poor little hobbit could be seen, kneeling on the hearthrug, shaking like a jelly that was melting. Then he fell flat on the floor, and kept on calling out, Struck by lightning! Struck by lightning! over and over again, and that was all they could get out of him for a long time. So they took him and laid him out of the way on the drawing-room sofa with a drink at his elbow and they went back to their dark business. "'Excitable little fellow,' said Gandalf as they sat down again. "'Gets funny queer fits, but he is one of the best, one of the best, as fierce as a dragon in a pinch. If you have ever seen a dragon in a pinch, you will realize that this was only poetical exaggeration applied to any hobbit, even to old Took's great-granduncle Bullroarer, who was so huge for a hobbit that he could ride a horse. He charged the ranks of the goblins of Mount Graham in the Battle of the Green Fields and knocked their king Golfimble's head clean off with a wooden club. It sailed a hundred yards through the air and went down a rabbit hole, and in this way the battle was won and the game of golf invented at the same moment. In the meanwhile, however, Bull Roarer's gentler descendant was reviving in the drawing room. After a while, and a drink, he crept nervously to the door of the parlor. This is what he heard, glowing speaking. Huh, <laughs> or some snort more or less like that. Will he do, do you think? It's all very well for Gandalf to talk about this hobbit being fierce, but one shriek like that in a moment of excitement would be enough to wake the dragon and all his relatives, and kill the lot of us. I think it sounded more like fright than excitement. 
In fact, if it had not been for the sign on the door, I should have been sure we had come to the wrong house. As soon as I clapped eyes on the little fellow bobbing and puffing on the mat, I had my doubts. He looks more like a grocer than a burglar. Then Mr. Baggins turned the handle and went in. The Took side had won. He suddenly felt he would go without bed and breakfast to be thought fierce. As for little fellow bobbing on the mat, it almost made him really fierce. Many a time afterwards, the Baggins part regretted what he did now, and he said to himself, Bilbo, you were a fool. You walked right in and put your foot in it. Pardon me, he said, if I have overheard words that you were saying. I don't pretend to understand what you are talking about or your reference to burglars, but I think I am right in believing, this is what he called being on his dignity, that you think I am no good. I will show you. I have no signs on my door. It was painted a week ago, and I am quite sure you have come to the wrong house. As soon as I saw your funny faces on the doorstep, I had my doubts, but treat it as the right one. Tell me what you want done, and I will try it. If I have to walk from here to the east of east and fight the wild wereworms in the last desert. I had a great, great, great grand uncle once, Bull Roarer Took, and... Yes, yes, but that was long ago, said Glowen. I was talking about you. And I assure you, there is a mark on this door, the usual one in the trade, or used to be. Burglar wants a good job, plenty of excitement and reasonable reward. That's how it's usually read. You can say expert treasure hunter instead of burglar if you like. Some of them do. It's all the same to us. Gandalf told us that there was a man of the sort in these parts looking for a job at once, and that he had arranged for a meeting here this Wednesday tea time. Of course there's a mark, said Gandalf. I put it there myself for very good reasons. You asked me to find the fourteenth man for your expedition, and I chose Mr. Baggins. Just let any one say I chose the wrong man or the wrong house, and you can stop at thirteen and have all the bad luck you like, or go back to digging coal. He scowled so angrily at Glowing that the dwarf huddled back in his chair, and when Bilbo tried to open his mouth to ask a question, he turned and frowned at him and stuck out his bushy eyebrows till Bilbo shut his mouth tight with a snap. That's right, said Gandalf. Let's have no more argument. I have chosen Mr. Baggins, and that ought to be enough for all of you. If I say he is a burglar, a burglar he is, or will be, when the time comes. There is a lot more in him than you guess, and a deal more than he has any idea of himself. You may, possibly, all live to thank me yet. Now, Bilbo, my boy, fetch the lamp, and let's have a little light on this. On the table, in the light of a big lamp with a red shade, he spread a piece of parchment, rather like a map. This was made by Thror, your grandfather, Thorin, he said in answer to the dwarves' excited questions. It is a plan of the mountain. I don't see that this will help us much, said Thorin disappointedly after a glance. I remember the mountain well enough and the lands about it. And I know where Mirkwood is, and the withered heath where the great dragons bred. There's a dragon marked in red on the mountain, said Balin. But it will be easy enough to find him without that, if we ever arrive there. There is one point that you haven't noticed, said the wizard. And that is the secret entrance. You see that rune on the west side, and the hand pointing to it from the other runes? That marks a hidden passage to the lower halls. Look at the map in this chapter, and you will see there the runes in red. It may have been secret once, said Thorin, but how do we know that it is secret any longer? Old Smog has lived there long enough now to find out anything there is to know about those caves. He may, but he can't have used it for years and years. Why? Because it is too small. Five feet high the door, and three may walk abreast, say the runes. But Smog could not creep into a hole that size, not even when he was a young dragon. Certainly not after devouring so many of the dwarves and men of Dale. It seems a great big hole to me, squeaked Bilbo, who had no experience of dragons and only of hobbit holes. He was getting excited and interested again, so that he forgot to keep his mouth shut. He loved maps, and in his hall there hung a large one of the county round with all his favorite walks marked on it in red ink. 
How could such a large door be kept secret from everybody outside, apart from the dragon? he asked. He was only a little hobbit, you must remember. In lots of ways, said Gandalf. But in what way this one has been hidden, we don't know without going to see. From what it says on the map, I should guess there is a closed door which was made to look exactly like the side of the mountain. That is the usual dwarves' method. I think that is right, isn't it? Quite right, said Thorin. Also, went on Gandalf, I forgot to mention that with the map went a key, a small and curious key. Here it is, he said, and handed to Thorin a key with a long barrel and intricate wards made of silver. Keep it safe. Indeed I will, said Thorin, and he fastened it upon a fine chain that hung about his neck and under his jacket. Now things begin to look more hopeful. This news alters them much for the better. So far we have had no clear idea what to do. We thought of going east, as quiet and careful as we could, as far as the long lake. After that the trouble would begin. A long time before that, if I know anything about the roads east, interrupted Gandalf. We might go from there up along the river running, went on Thorin, taking no notice, and so to the ruins of Dale, the old town in the valley there, under the shadow of the mountain. But we none of us liked the idea of the front gate. The river runs right out of it through the great cliff at the south of the mountain, and out of it comes the dragon, too, far too often unless he has changed his habits. That would be no good, said the wizard, not without a mighty warrior, even a hero. I tried to find one, but warriors are busy fighting one another in distant lands, and in this neighborhood heroes are scarce, or simply not to be found. Swords in these parts are mostly blunt, and axes are used for trees and shields as cradles or dish covers, and dragons are comfortably far off, and therefore legendary. That is why I settled on burglary, especially when I remembered the existence of a side door. And here is our little Bilbo Baggins. The burglar. The chosen and selected burglar. So, now, let's get on and make some plans. Very well, then, said Thorin. Supposing the burglar expert gives us some ideas or suggestions. He turned with mock politeness to Bilbo. First, I should like to know a bit more about things, said he, feeling all confused and a bit shaky inside, but so far still tookishly determined to go on with things. I mean, about the gold, and the dragon, and all that, and how it got there, and who it belongs to, and so on, and further. Bless me, said Thorin, haven't you got a map? And didn't you hear our song? And haven't we been talking about all this for hours? All the same, I should like it all plain and clear, said he, obstinately, putting on his business manner, usually reserved for people who tried to borrow money off him and doing his best to appear wise and prudent and professional and live up to Gandalf's recommendation. Also, I should like to know about risks, out-of-pocket expenses, time required and remuneration and so forth, by which he meant, what am I going to get out of it, and am I going to come back alive? Oh, very well, said Thorin. Long ago, in my grandfather Thor's time, our family was driven out of the far north and came back with all their wealth and their tools to this mountain on the map. It had been discovered by my far ancestor, Thrain the Old, but now they mined and they tunneled and they made huger halls and greater workshops, and in addition I believe they found a good deal of gold and a great many jewels too. Anyway, they grew immensely rich and famous, and my grandfather was king under the mountain again, and treated with great reverence by the mortal men who lived to the south, and were gradually spreading up the running river as far as the valley overshadowed by the mountain. They built the merry town of Dale there in those days. Kings used to send for our smiths, and reward even the least skillful most richly. Fathers would beg us to take their sons as apprentices, and pay us handsomely, especially in food supplies, which we never bothered to grow or find for ourselves. Altogether, those were good days for us, and the poorest of us had money to spend and to lend, and leisure to make beautiful things just for the fun of it. Not to speak of the most marvellous and magical toys, the like of which is not to be found in the world nowadays. So my grandfather's halls became full of armor and jewels and carvings and cups, and the toy market of Dale was the wonder of the North. Undoubtedly, that was what brought the dragon. 
Dragons steal gold and jewels, you know, from men and elves and dwarves, wherever they can find them, and they guard their plunder as long as they live, which is practically forever unless they are killed, and never enjoy a brass ring of it. Indeed, they hardly know a good bit of work from a bad, though they usually have a good notion of the current market value. And they can't make a thing for themselves, not even mend a little loose scale of their armor. There were lots of dragons in the north in those days, and gold was probably getting scarce up there, with the dwarves flying south or getting killed, and all the general waste and destruction that dragons make going from bad to worse. There was a most specially greedy, strong, and wicked worm called Smog. One day, he flew up into the air and came south. The first we heard of it was a noise like a hurricane coming from the north, and the pine trees on the mountain creaking and cracking in the wind. Some of the dwarves who happened to be outside, I was one, luckily, a fine adventurous lad in those days, always wandering about, and it saved my life that day. Well, from a good way off we saw the dragon settle on our mountain in a spout of flame. Then he came down the slopes, and when he reached the woods, they all went up in fire. By that time all the bells were ringing in Dale, and the warriors were arming. The dwarves rushed out of their great gate, but there was the dragon waiting for them. None escaped that way. The river rushed up in steam, and a fog fell on Dale and in the fog the dragon came on them, and destroyed most of the warriors. The usual unhappy story. It was only too common in those days. Then he went back, and crept in through the front gate, and routed out all the halls and lanes and tunnels, alleys, cellars, mansions, and passages. After that, there were no dwarves left alive inside, and he took all their wealth for himself. Probably, for that is the dragon's way, he has piled it all up in a great heap far inside, and sleeps on it for a bed. Later, he used to crawl out of the great gate and come by night to Dale, and carry away people, especially maidens, to eat, until Dale was ruined, and all the people dead or gone. What goes on there now, I don't know for certain, but I don't suppose anyone lives nearer to the mountain than the far edge of the long lake nowadays. The few of us that were well outside sat and wept in hiding, and cursed smog. And there we were unexpectedly joined by my father and my grandfather, with singed beards. They looked very grim, but they said very little. When I asked how they had got away, they told me to hold my tongue and said that one day, in the proper time, I should know. After that we went away, and we have had to earn our livings as best we could up and down the lands, often enough sinking as low as blacksmith work, or even coal mining. But we have never forgotten our stolen treasure, and even now, when I will allow we have a good bit laid by and are not so badly off, here Thorin stroked the gold chain around his neck, we still mean to get it back, and to bring our curses home to Smog, if we can. I have often wondered about my father's and my grandfather's escape. I see now they must have had a private side door which only they knew about, but apparently they made a map, and I should like to know how Gandalf got hold of it, and why it did not come down to me, the rightful heir. I did not get hold of it, I was given it, said the wizard. Your grandfather, Thror, was killed, you remember, in the mines of Moria by Azog the Goblin. Curse his name, yes, said Thorin. And Thrain, your father, went away on the 21st of April, a hundred years ago last Thursday, and has never been seen by you since. True, true, said Thorin. Well, your father gave me this to give to you. And if I have chosen my own time and way for handing it over, you can hardly blame me, considering the trouble I had to find you. Your father could not remember his own name when he gave me the paper, and he never told me yours, so on the whole I think I ought to be praised and thanked. Here it is, said he, handing the map to Thorin. I don't understand, said Thorin, and Bilbo felt he would have liked to say the same. The explanation did not seem to explain. Your grandfather, said the wizard, slowly and grimly, gave the map to his son for safety before he went to the mines of Moria. 
Your father went away to try his luck with the map after your grandfather was killed, and lots of adventures of a most unpleasant sort he had, but he never got near the mountain. How he got there I don't know, but I found him a prisoner in the dungeons of the necromancer. Whatever were you doing there? asked Thorin with a shudder, and all the dwarves shivered. Never you mind. I was finding things out, as usual, and a nasty, dangerous business it was. Even I, Gandalf, only just escaped. I tried to save your father, but it was too late. He was witless and wandering, and had forgotten almost everything except the map and the key. We have long ago paid the goblins of Moria, said Thorin. We must give a thought to the necromancer. Don't be absurd! He is an enemy far beyond the powers of all the dwarves put together, if they could all be collected again from the four corners of the world. The one thing your father wished was for his son to read the map and use the key. The dragon and the mountain are more than big enough tasks for you. Hear, hear, said Bilbo, and accidentally said it aloud. Hear what? they all said, turning suddenly towards him, and he was so flustered that he answered, "'Hear what I've got to say.' "'What's that?' they asked. "'Well, I should say that you ought to go east and have a look round. After all, there is the side door, and dragons must sleep sometimes, I suppose. If you sit on the doorstep long enough, I dare say you will think of something. And, well, don't you know, I think we have talked long enough for one night, if you see what I mean.' What about bed and an early start and all that? I will give you a good breakfast before you go. Before we go, I suppose you mean, said Thorin. Aren't you the burglar? And isn't sitting on the doorstep your job not to speak of getting inside the door? But I agree about bed and breakfast. I like six eggs with my ham when starting on a journey. Fried, not poached. And mind you don't break them. After all, the others had ordered their breakfasts, without so much as a please, which annoyed Bilbo very much, they all got up. The hobbit had to find room for them all, and filled all his spare rooms and made beds on chairs and sofas before he got them all stowed, and went to his own little bed very tired and not altogether happy. One thing he did make his mind up about was not to bother to get up very early and cook everybody else's wretched breakfast. The Tukishness was wearing off, and he was not now quite so sure that he was going on any journey in the morning. As he lay in bed, he could hear Thorin still humming to himself in the best bedroom next to him. Far over the misty mountains cold, to dungeons deep and caverns old, we must away ere break of day to find our long forgotten gold. Bilbo went to sleep with that in his ears, and it gave him very uncomfortable dreams. It was long after the break of day when he woke up. <laughs>